Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's great to see everyone again after our little summer vacation. Um, and so we're kicking off the fall um, with Michael Chavez, who is a project development manager at Youth Build. Um, Youth Build is a nonprofit that trains low income um, teenage, well, young people 16 to 24 years old in construction and construction related industries. And they've been doing a lot of work with the city of Boston around the ADU program. And so Michael has um, generously offered to come um, to our meeting to tell us um, both about the work that Youth Build has been doing and also give us insights into how um, Boston's program has been running. And um, since he knows a lot more about it than I do, I will stop my intro there <laughs> before I misspeak. Um, so it's our pleasure to um, have Michael join us today and I will pass the baton to him. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, again, yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm Mike. Uh, I work with Youth Build Boston. I'm a registered architect. And uh, so I'm, you know, my role here at Youth Build and is to, you know, focus mostly on the design and project development of affordable housing that we do here. And I'll, uh, I'll share my screen to um, talk a little bit more about all this. But uh, so I have a you know, presentation I put together. Um, just kind of about right off the bat, how many people know about ADUs in the city of Boston or even outside the city of Boston because you know each city each state's doing something a little bit different but is it is it a, a pretty familiar typology or is it generally okay great it sounds like a lot of people know a decent amount um, which is good um, let me see if I can maximize this Does that work? Anyway, this is be fine. Um, so yeah, so, it, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, just the ADU program in the city of Boston and then some of the kind of things that I've been finding out over the past year that we've been doing it. So I think I'm going to also be learning a lot from you all because I'm sure you've all either had products that relate to the, some of the things that I've been, you know, uh, working with with the ADU program or, um, uh, you know, it, it, I want to have this be a, a, a conversation there at the end. So um, so today's agenda. So who we are, who is Youth Build Boston, what do we do? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ADU program overall uh, in terms of the city of Boston. So I used a couple slides, talked to Wandi, who's a, a fellow with the city, with, you know, kind of split between D&D &D and the BSA. And she said that I could use her slides because we did a presentation about this at the NOMA uh, meeting about a month ago. Um, things to consider before design when it comes to ADUs and then things to consider during design. So we're going to kind of jump into a little bit of some of the projects of themselves and some of the challenges we've had, some of the, the benefits we've seen, that kind of stuff. So we'll get a little bit of nitty gritty information there. Um, and also talk a little bit about how I've started to structure our design fees, because I think this has always been a topic of conversation that a lot of architects I've known that have an interest in doing ADUs and thinking about, you know, they're not big projects, but how do I structure them to be able to work with folks to, to see how this goes. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit about homeowner funding and related design construction considerations at the end. Um, so that's the overview for today's uh, conversation. So Youth Build Boston, um, we were, we, we were founded in 1990. Uh, so we've been around, this is actually our 30th anniversary. We were supposed to have a big party this year, obviously got canceled. So we'll see if we can do this in 2021. Um, but this is uh, what we call our impact triangle. And so the three areas that we really tend to focus mostly on is empowering youth, um, so uh, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, we work with um, 16 to 24 year olds, actually 14 and 24 year olds um, and through multiple different programs. Um, some of them are out of school, some of them are in school and some of them are, uh, you know, have already graduated and are looking to get into the building trades. So we provide various types of youth programming to support, um, you know, growth and, and uh, neighborhood responsibility. Um, we try to impact the industry. So we are a pre-apprentice program with the Carpenters Union um, formally. And so a lot of our graduates, uh, who complete our program end up going into the carpenters, but they can go into any trade that they want to. We have in the connections and, and uh, placement opportunities for all the different trades. Um, but we also tend to focus a lot on architecture and design too. And so we have a program for kids who are still in high school and trying to, uh, you know, we teach them architecture and design and then they um, have a community partner that they then do a pro bono design service for. And then hopefully that encourages them to go on to college and or the field in general for design. Um, and then lastly, the strengthening neighborhoods corner uh, so we are a developer, designer, and builder of, of affordable housing. And so we focus mostly on one to three family homes. 
Um, and so we kind of, you know, are all, all inclusive with those, those processes. That's a lot of what I do is that pre-development stuff, working with the city to get vacant parcels or uh, uh, existing homes that have been uh, foreclosed and abandoned for decades. And we do full gut rehabs on those. Um, and then, you know, those are our training sites. So our young people go onto those sites and that's how they learn how to build is actually on those affordable housing sites, um, which then allows them to get placed onto real job sites. So some of it's about swinging hammers, but most of it's, can you show up at 7 a.m. when it's snowing to, to swing your hammer? <laughs> it's always the hardest part for anybody. So um, so that's that's what we tend to focus a lot on. Uh, and then of course we do a lot of community service projects throughout the city of Boston. This is some examples of some work that we're that we have done or, or, or are currently doing. So at the top row is some various commercial buildings that we've worked with. Um, the top left is our headquarters. So we are, uh, we got this in 2012 as an abandoned fire station here in Roxbury um, that had been abandoned since the seventies and they put an RFP out the city um, for a nonprofit to move in here. So we won the RFP and we did a full gut rehab and now my office is in that second floor there on the left. So that's where I'm sitting right now. Um, the other building there in the center is uh, just to the right of that is uh, two buildings that we own over on Dudley Street. Um, so we again we tend to have uh, some commercial properties that we own we rent out to other nonprofits and that's how we make uh, you know we're able to pay some of our bills is through that rental process. We are also landlords. Um, and then the bottom row is all di different types of housing that we've done um, over the course of the past. You see these are probably the past three years. Um, those are different homes that we've completed. All of those are new construction except for the far actually the second to I guess the middle one there, the blue house, um, that was a, a gut rehab. So there's some examples of some of the types of housing and projects that we do as an organization. Um, when it comes to the ADU program, we kind of ended up, we, we kind of fell into this, you know, a lot of our work that we currently do with affordable housing and gut rehabs and our knowledge behind design and construction of that type of, uh, of that type of building, um, there was, uh, you know, the, the city had piloted the program and talk a little bit about that uh, in a second here, but they had piloted it back in 2018, formally started the program in 2019. And uh, there was some kind of lack of architecture or lack of design services out there for folks who wanted to do an ADU, but they didn't know where to go. And so somehow we got a call from a guy who wanted to do it and we started, moved forward with him. And since then, it's just kind of been word of mouth without advertising. And we've had, I've, I've spoken to, you know, a little over 21 people now about ADUs and um, worked on 11 projects. So that's what we'll talk about in a second here. So we ended up just kind of falling into it based on our previous work of community impact and affordable housing and knowledge of existing buildings. And that's how we kind of got into this, into this uh, thing in the first place. Now the D&D's goals and the mayor's goals with the, the, his, his uh, 2030 housing plan includes ADUs as part of how to count those numbers uh, to increase the amount of housing in the city of Boston. Um, so a goal there being to increase affordable housing options in neighborhoods and so everything in blue is kind of how we're trying to answer those things through ADUs. So we are doing housing options. Um, we would call them affordable. You know, that's that's a question up still that I think we're learning about, right? Like if a homeowner wants to charge what market rate, you know, rent might be, that's up to the homeowner, right? So I think the question about affordability is still there. But if it's also someone who's using that money to then pay off their own bills or pay off their own debt or whatever, that's also a benefit. So we're also kind of some of the internal discussions are about what, what does it mean to have affordable housing when it comes to ADUs versus just housing and or allowing a homeowner to be able to, you know, put money back into their homes, et cetera. Um, support multi-generational family arrangements and provide opportunities for aging in place. And so we've had several projects where that was the overall goal of doing ADUs. They wanted to have, you know, grandma live with you or, or you're the, uh, you know, you're the, 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 the person who's retiring and you want your kid to move in with you and help, you know, pay your rent and that kind of stuff. So, um, so it's an idea of how do we bring families back together again through ADUs. Um, create safer living arrangements by incentivizing homeowners to legalize Ill illegal rental units. Um, so again, this is about reducing harm or death. So if there was a fire and no one knows that you're living there, that could be very, very bad, obviously. And, uh, or there could also just be things that aren't up to code. So there's, you know, um, opportunities for someone to harm themselves or fall down and not everyone know or anything like that. So, um, so we're also, there's two units that we've looked at and one that's currently um, about to get permitted that was an illegal unit that we're now legalizing and, you know, doing some adjustments to. So that is a real thing. Um, support homeowners to remain in their homes by generating steady rental income. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, this is about economic justice and what I'm calling community money. So, you know, although it's really nice to get, you know, an 80 unit building up and say 20 of those are affordable, um, all that rent ends up going back into the developer's hands, right? So some of that money goes into keeping the building going, but then it also goes into the, you know, the company, whether it's a private developer or a community development corporation or whatever, um, that then gets spent wherever. Um, the ADU allows the homeowner, that money goes directly back into the homeowner's hands to spend wherever they want to the community. They can, you know, reinvest back into their homes. So there is a little bit of a difference about, you know, the, 
uh, economic justice of you know keeping money in the community and keeping the rent in the community for the individual homeowners rather than going back into the developers hands for a lot of these larger buildings so there's also discussions about where that money is spent and how um, using an existing infrastructure to achieve the city housing goals so this is all about the climate justice piece for for us and that's how we really approach this um, so you know we have existing infrastructure in a home how can we maximize it to add another unit without having to you know spend a lot of money trying to you know do new construction um, but also the idea about you know again density in the city and what that means for climate justice how do we you know uh, try to incorporate transportation around these kinds of things uh, you know uh, continue to not have cars in the city if you can have more people in the city that kind of stuff so there's a lot of questions also about how does ADU play a role in the bigger picture of climate justice and that kind of thing right there's a lot of big beautiful buildings going up in Mattapan and Dorchester and Roxbury where we're, where we're living but it's tending to be surrounded by very inefficient very old um, housing stock and so these ADUs play a role in trying to improve that old housing stock and that kind of very old infrastructure in its own way so uh, what is an ADU here in the, in the city of Boston? Uh, so what does it mean here? Because again, it's, it's different in all kinds of different places. Um, so this was a process that they decided to start back in 2016 when they started having community meetings to figure out exactly how they wanted to move into the ADU process in the city. Um, in, the, in 2017, the city, uh, the new urban mechanics of, of pilot and zoning language written. So they basically started to think about, okay, well, how are we going to allow this to happen in the city of Boston? A lot of other cities have detached units. This is all about being in the existing building envelope. Um, so they started to write zoning and code and kind of understanding what that process was going to look like. Um, jump ahead to, to winter of 2017, where they launched uh, an eight, uh, you know, a year and a half, an 18 month pilot um, process uh, to, and they focused specifically on Mattapan. I think it was in East Boston. And they also had a certain age level. So I think if you were 65 and older and had a certain income qualification that you qualified for that pilot program and they wanted to really focus on that particular age and, and, and neighborhood um, and to see, see where it would go. And then in spring of 2019, then they launched anywhere in the city of Boston at any income level, any age doesn't matter. Um, you can have an ADU if you, you know, take the, take the check marks off the boxes if, if you qualify for, you know, code and a bunch of other things, right? That was kind of overall thing. So it hasn't really been that long. It's been a few years, but really it's only been about a year and a half that this program has been up and running fully uh, here in the city of Boston. So, you know, what are some of the things that you need to, as a, as a homeowner, to, to know about going into this process? Um, you can, it's only for one, two or three family homes. Um, so, and this was also part of the pilot here, but most of these have carried on into the, into the uh, full program. So it's, if you're a four units or higher, you're not allowed to put an ADU on your on your property. Um, you have to be a, an owner occupied. So you have to live in one of the units that is currently there now. Um, the, the new unit has to be within the building envelope, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in terms of like how strict the city of Boston really is on that. Um, and it has to be above the floodplain, so you can't be within an EPA flood zone. Um, when it comes to zoning, uh, there's actually most of the zoning, and that's kind of the attractive aspect of this program, is that most of the zoning is not applicable to an ADU. So FAR, or Florida Area Ratio, is not applicable to ADUs. It doesn't count as part of the overall FAR for the home. Um, they uh, are exempt from occupancy limits, you know, when it comes to the, the property overall, the house. And you don't have to add additional parking for the ADU once you put it in there as well. So all those things are gone. You also just don't have to go through the ZBA at all to be able to put an ADU in your house. So you can get permitted and get a building permit and skip the whole ZBA thing um, for that. So if you're in a single family home and it's a single family, you know, it's rated 1F 6,000 or whatever for your, for your neighborhood, that second unit can still be put in that, that house without having to go through a community process. Um, but code wise, you still have to have ceiling height, you know, you have to be ceiling height uh, requirements. So, you know, seven foot for single family uh, and then seven foot six for two and three. You always have to have two means of egress, although I did do a studio that they're allowing, they would allow one means of egress if the studio is small enough. Um, uh, emergency egress windows in all sleeping areas, utility shutoffs in a common area. And then you have to have a, if you're a two family, you have to have a domestic sprinkler system, like basically a water tank that's hooked up to a domestic water system um, for just the ADU itself. And if you are a three family and you're adding that fourth unit, then you have to have sprinkler that ADU only, but it has to be connected out to the street. That's still, that's still part of the system now. So again, the types of ADUs that they explored, but decided to focus on here in the city is that it cannot be attached. So you can't put an addition on your home. You can't have a bump out on your home. You can't put a dormer on your roof. Uh, you can't have a detached uh, unit. So that's where the accessory word comes from, right? It's accessory dwelling units a lot in California. You hear this a lot in Oregon, Seattle. 
Um, it's like a, a conversion of a garage, or you can build a brand new structure on your property. That's not allowed as right as of so far in the city of Boston. Uh, it has to be within the city or within the, the building envelope. You know, it can be in your attic, it can be in your basement, or you can carve out a section of something on the first or second floor, as long as again, it has two means of egress, et cetera, within the building uh, envelope. The only thing you can do on the outside is if you need to add like a little, you know, doggy dormer on the back of your home where there used to be a bulkhead so that you have proper way to get out. You're not pushing up two doors to get out, um, or you need a little kind of overhang covering for the front to come in. Those are allowed, but you can't put like a full addition or a dorm or anything that physically changes the, the shape of your building. This is just some more examples here. Again, these are all the, the city slides um, about ways that you can think about your ADU, carving out units, basement conversions, attic conversions, et cetera. Um, the, the resources that they provide homeowners, and the, I've been using a lot of these resources myself as well. Um, if you go on to the DD's website, they have a whole section dedicated to the ADU program. Um, and so they have an online toolkit that allows you that you know, describes what the process is for applying for a permit. Um, there are some funding opportunities, and I'll talk about that here in a second, and uh, details about the building code requirements, which is really like a one sheet, you know, big item checklist that says if you, you need to meet all these things to be able to do an ADU. Um, but they do require that homeowners have an architect, you know, a stamp set of drawings to be able to pull the permit so they can't sketch it out themselves or have a contractor do the drawings. They need to have a licensed architect to do that. Um, and that's one reason we've gotten involved and I'm kind of sharing as much as I can with other architects who might want to think about this as a potential, um, you know, uh, something that you want to get involved in. Um, so that is required as, as an architect. Um, the city does have a loan program. So if you're income qualified, you can get up to $30,000 to put towards construction of your ADU. Um, and then if you are slightly overqualified, then they'll do like, you know, 25,000 and a little bit over that's 20,000. So there are kind of a range of uh, of, of money that can be applied towards the, the towards the construction projects, depending on what your income level is, and they'll help you help pay for that. The one hang up, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end, is that um, the city pays the contractor directly um, for that thirty thousand. They're not going to cut the owner a check for thirty thousand, and then the owner then pays the contractor. The city pays the contractor, and so there have been some delays in the contractors getting paid, and therefore delays in construction because they're like, hey, if I'm not getting my check, I can't do much work until I get that, right? And so if I have to wait for two months to get my check, then that's a delay. So that's something we talk to the homeowners about and if they're going to go that route. Um, and you can also get a, a home equity loan through the city of Boston as well. So there are ways to help fund and pay for the ADU. Um, and then preliminary review, which I have found the most helpful across the board, is that the city uh, of Boston puts on a, a, a workshop for anyone who's interested in, in ADUs the first Thursday of the month. And so the first Thursday of any month, the homeowner can just sit in and listen. Architects can just kind of sit in and listen. Uh, or if you have a, a project that you want to kind of walk through, it doesn't have to be completed yet. You can have just some sketches, some ideas. And so the uh, city of Boston is represented by the fire department is there, uh, the ZBA, so the zoning uh, folks are there, special services is there, uh, D&D themselves, so Jay Lee and Eva are, are both there. Um, and so it's kind of a collection of everyone who would have to sign off on this all in one room. And so that, you know, uh, homeowners and or architects or anyone else can ask questions about their idea of what they want to do with this ADU and they can get feedback from all those different perspectives at the same time. And so I've used that a lot. So when I'm working with clients, I'll, you know, upload their, their, their drawings, photos, things like that. And then they'll we'll walk through the project and they'll give me feedback on the spot, which allows me then to make my adjustments and then go into the permit process that way. So that's a really big um, help. Um, and so with, with the pilot program with the city here, the, this is what they found during their pilot program. So that during that 18 months, um, they had 89% of their applications were for basement conversions. 4% uh, were for uh, carving out, you know, the first floor and then 7% were for attics. So really they found that, you know, and this is actually true for all the numbers that I've had as well, that basements are really the big focus area for people doing ADUs in the city so far. Um, and some of the questions that were brought back after the pilot program that uh, you know, were requested of D&D was uh, mostly that they want to add additional neighborhoods, which they did. Now it's open across the entire city. Um, allow attached and detached ADUs. And this is something that the city is currently exploring right now. So what would it be like if Boston allowed backyard units, um, tiny houses, uh, existing structures like garage and carriage houses to be converted into ADUs? And so right now the city is about to, I think next year, um, do another 18 month pilot for detached uh, ADUs. And they're really focusing on existing structures um, to start there um, before new construction and the really garages and carriage houses. Um, the Boston Landmarks Commission is really interested in carriage houses because they're seeing a lot of 
you know, really dilapidated carriage houses around the city and they see that this opportunity might be a way for um, people to reinvest into their carriage homes so that even though if there's someone living there, it actually makes it kind of bring the historic character back to the community. And so they're also interested in this particular um, uh, program. Um, and so there's things that they're exploring with that right now. And then other changes that were requested, uh, remove the owner occupant restriction. So that was something that a lot of people were asking for. Uh, remove restrictions on condos. Right now, if you had a condo building or you had lived in a condo in a, a larger building, um, you're, you're not allowed to convert it. It has to be like a you know single family or two family or three family that's owned by one individual. Um, so they're they're exploring that as an option as well. Um, so if you're in a triple decker, for example, I can't cut my third floor unit up into two units as it stands if, if it's a condo. Um, and then they're also looking at various ways to add additional funding for ADU programming. And I think they might actually bump up that 30,000 to 50,000 uh, over the next year or so. And then some of the obstacles that they're facing right now. Uh, so issues with understanding and adhering to building code requirements related to the ADU, which is something that we're spending a lot of time right now. It's, it's, I don't wanna say it's somewhat subjective, but we do spend a lot of time going through, well, if we did this and this, then maybe we'll allow that to happen, right? Or whatever. So it's not as clear cut as a lot of other projects are when it comes to ADUs and codes. Um, Increases in the final cost compared to the original budget estimates. So uh, during the pilot, the average cost in the original estimates for some of the projects were 50,000. And by the time the permit was set was done and they were about to bid again, they went up to 75,000. So that was a big issue for a lot of homeowners. And so um, we're gonna talk a little bit at the end about how I financed my fee structure or how I've set up my fee structure. And it, helps, it, it kind of focuses a lot on this, this issue right here and trying to help folks uh, you know, flush out as much as possible during the design process. And then the process was too complicated and I cleared up and I think they're still trying to work through that as well. So let's talk about this, the 21 projects that I've been involved in in some form or fashion. So this is what I've worked on since summer of last year through now. Um, so 21 projects, I've gone to 21 homes, discussed and went through, you know, in, in detail with the homeowners opportunities to do an ADU for their, house, for their homes. Um, out of those 21, seven, seven are currently in design and that's what the red dots are on the map there. Um, all the, the uh, blue dots are the homes that are that we discussed, but they decided to either hold off on or not do at all or, or whatever. Um, out of those 21, four of them have been permitted. Uh, so two of them are currently under construction and two of them have been completed. Um, all of those have been done in Mattapan. And then one of those actually is a, a home that we're building. So we're, our, we're breaking ground on a new home in October. And we have designed the basement to be set up for an ADU if the homeowner wants to do that down the road. So we've kind of stubbed out all the plumbing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that's kind of a, a cheat for us <laughs> in that number. Um, and out of those numbers, 19 have been basements, one attic and one first floor uh, are out of the four that were built. Uh, the total cost for construction was between 80 to $105,000, depending on the project. Um, and out of those four that were built, three of them were basements and one of them is a, uh, the first floor conversion and you know cutting it in half um of the people i've worked with out of those 21 fifth you know under 50 years of age a third of them were under 50 two-thirds were over 50 and if you looked in more detail in those numbers the majority of the folks that i'm working with are about in their 60s or so so they're in that retirement age kind of wanting to stop working that second job or be able to formally retire and have that you know income to help pay all the bills that they're currently having to work for um, i've heard that story a lot uh, and out of those uh, units, uh, three were multi-generational. So I asked, why are you going into the program in the first place? What's your goal? So three of them were to have, uh, include, you know, bring family back into the home and have it be multi-generational. Two of them were conversions of illegal units and 16 of them were for the sole purpose of earning money through rental. So some things to consider before design. So as you're, as an architect and I'm, as I'm walking into these projects, I kind of right off the bat, I have five things that I try to look at and help the homeowner right away to see if this is something feasible or not. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, number one is demolition. Uh, you know, what's, if there's something down there now, what do we have to demo and remove? Uh, structural changes that might need to happen in the home to be able to meet code and other things. Um, moving and replacing existing meters and mechanical electrical plumbing systems that are down in the basement now. Uh, and I, most of these, again, I'm focusing on basements because that's been the majority of what I've been working on, although I will talk about the other two projects as well. Uh, zoning, is there anything outside of the, you know, other than the ADU itself, are there any zoning issues with that we might have to encompass, especially if you're doing a first floor or attic space? And then head height is always an issue in the basement, of course. 
So here's an example of, you know, demolition. So this woman had her, it's a two family and it's split down the middle, you know, one unit on the left, one on the right. It's kind of like a townhome style. And on her side of the uh, space, she had kind of put down a, a bathroom and kind of a livable space down there. So she had already done some work, but none of it was necessarily, you know, it wasn't done uh, legally per se. It was just, you know, put in there to help with, uh, you know, overflow. She had family over or whatever. Um, and so when I'm thinking about demolition, you know, what are some of the things to consider when I'm looking at photos like this? And so I'm looking at the floors, for example, if you look at that top picture there, you can see that there's three different floor levels that are, that are happening there. Um, some of it's due to the plumbing that the back room back there is a bathroom. So she had to lift the entire thing up to try and get, you know, plumbing down to the ground. Um, but it only has like a five and foot six ceiling height in that bathroom. So it's really low. Um, so do I need to relevel the floors and take all that out? Do I need to do any replacing? Is there water damage anywhere from, you know, because it's a basement, has anything come up from the ground or come through the walls or anything like that? So what is the, you know, love the condition of the floors and how much work am I going to need to do just to get everything cleaned up and, and ready for any kind of construction? Um, for interior walls, uh, you know, if I'm going to be knocking down walls like this to do a brand new unit, um, are they structural or non-structural? Are they fire rated? So, you know, if, if the basement is shared between multiple units, uh, and they have separated out somehow are there any of those fire rated walls uh, between those units? Um, are there any signs of mold or insects or any other things that are going on down there? Um, on exterior walls, uh, you know, specifically for basements, are they field stone or port, uh, port in place concrete, you know, walls, um, which can make a difference in terms of the quality of the space downstairs, but also, um, you know, what kind of insulation you might want to think about when you're, when you're working down there. Uh, but if you're working upstairs, a first floor or an attic space, you know, are, are those walls insulated at all? Or is it just paper stuck in, you know, walls if it's a really old home, that kind of thing? Um, are there water and air penetrations somewhere coming in and out of the space? Sometimes you see that there was an old hole that was drilled out for a mechanical vent of some sort, and then they foamed it back in again. It's just basically a hole with foam inside of it, right? So what kind of things are you going to have to address uh, just as you're cleaning things out? Um, and then uh, for the ceiling, um, so for the ceiling uh, condition, the joists and girders and beams. So are any of them rotted? Are they are they bending? Are they uh, broken? Have they been chopped up by plumbers over the years and they have big cuts through them or big holes in them? That kind of stuff, right? Um, are they up to code? So I've had some issues with some um, you know inspectors looking at some joists and saying, look, you're gonna have to sister all of these. Are only two by sixes or two by eights or whatever, and I need at least two by tens in here. So you're gonna have to sister every single joist with a two by ten to make this thing work or whatever, right? So how much of the cost is it gonna be there if I have to demo all these things and then reveal all these other issues um and are there any existing uh, issues with existing penetrations vertically so if there's stuff in the basement that's all going up to the first and second floors where are all those penetrations happening and how clean are those penetrations um structural changes so you know there's a lot of basements as well that have um very low structural systems especially these you know old heavy timber girders that are running through the basement um, so this is two examples of two different projects here. Um, this one is, has a six foot three floor to, you know, bottom of girder height. This other one that it has a, a bedroom down in their basement is at six foot one floor to girder height. And so, you know, typically code says that you are not supposed to have anything that's below the, the finished ceiling more than six inches. Um, and so if I have a seven foot minimum, then I can't be lower than six foot six for my girder. But if that's down to six foot one or six foot three, then I'm, I'm breaking that. So some of the question is, is, now, how comfortable is the inspector number one with leaving that if it's going to cost a lot of money to be able to have to adjust those things but number two is it safe or not safe or can you put a door under there or in some kind of other opening right um so something that we're going to be doing actually in an upcoming project to deal with that situation that's actually this one that i'm showing with the the floor plan here in the top left photo is and please excuse my sketching skills on PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are much better at drawing on screens than I am, but this is a diagram, right? So most of the situations here we have, uh, most of the joists rest on top of a heavy timber girder. They kind of run across it or they sit on top of it and they overlap. Uh, and then and that's how they kind of are, are, are framed originally. And so uh, what we're going to, going to be doing is actually cutting those joists, lifting the heavy timber girder up to be flush with the bottom of the subfloor above, and then hanging all of the joists off that heavy timber girder so that, that the heavy timber girder again is up high. So we're still using that same structure, but to be able to do that, we're gonna have to shore up all of that floor, probably on the first floor and second floor. We then have to take the lolly columns out underneath we have to, you know, cut all the joists, lift the girder up, hang all the joists, and then put in new lolly columns with new two by two by two footings on underneath that, right? So there's a lot of work just to get this one single heavy timber girder up high enough to make this thing work. 
is that worth it to the homeowner? Uh, is that worth it for you know the the um, the rental income that they'll be earning? And so there's a lot of cost comparisons between what's the cost for me to do this versus how much do I think I can make over what period of time and how can I start earning that back? So in the analysis we did for this woman, it, it works out. So we're going to go that route. But uh, but that's one way that we're starting to look at how we deal with structural systems and existing homes to try and meet those requirements. And if there's anything, by the way, along the, you know, if, if you want to stop and ask some questions, have a conversation about these things, I'm happy to do so as well. And we can also do it at the end. So, um, so there, there is a question that just came in, Mike. Oh, sure. Um, in, instead of uh, cutting out the existing joints, could you reduce the steel? Have you do that? Sorry, I didn't quite hear you, Kristen. Oh, sorry. Um, alternatively, would you use steel instead of reusing and raising the beam? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could use steel. I think the main thing is, is, um, you know, head height again. So can, can the steel be, you know, do we have to cut anything to be able to be, have it be high enough no matter what? Um, so yes, steel is always an option. Um, it, it can be more expensive to buy a new steel system to do that. So I think, I think it's all, it's all relevant. So, you know, how deep would the steel be to be able to, to use that? Um, so if we're like in this situation here, where it's six foot three, and we're trying to span some distance. How how you know how deep can we make that steel? How less deep can we make it to make it worth that height to make up that height? Um, so good, but great question. And I'm not sure. I think that's we're all new to this, and I'd, I'd love to be able to keep working through it. If you guys have ideas, please let me know. And I'm, I'll, I'll use them. <laughs> um, so we have existing MEP systems that are oftentimes in basements, especially. So you see stuff like this all the time, right? This one on the right here is like a beauty. I don't even know what's going on. It's like something I might see in the ICA with, you know, can you trace the pipe to go wherever it goes to, right? So I don't even know what's going on there, but there's stuff all over the place. Um, but this is the kind of thing oftentimes you see in, in a whole bunch of different basements. Um, and so what happens if you're trying to do a, a new design for a basement, especially a basement, um, and you have stuff like this that could, you know, in the way, right? How do you start to work around it? How do you how do you have to lift pipes up again to meet that head height requirement? Um, can you switch out systems? Uh, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of questions about just the cost of replacing these, moving these, all the systems uh, around it. If you have, you know, forced air systems and all the duct work that's down in the basement, how do you move all of that just to get your ADU down there? So that's a huge cost in and of itself for a lot of times for homeowners. Um, so, you know, some things to think about, uh, you know, what type of system and energy source is or are the current units using? So there's a project in Mattapan that um, what he did is he had, uh, you know, radiators up in his, it was a single family. So he had radiators upstairs. And what he did is he switched out that with a, a combi system, a combination system that allowed him to have domestic hot water and still heat the existing radiator system because he had a two, a two pipe system um, using a combi system and replace all that. So basically kept his radiators in place upstairs and uh, was able to, you know, go from that old system to a, a wall mounted, smaller, more efficient unit. And uh, it worked out for him. So the questions is, you know, are people using steam, forced air, uh, you know, any, something else in between? And are there ways to update and replace those systems as part of the ADU improvement um, for the rest of the house? Um, do any of those systems require venting? I mean, all these things always hug chimneys for a reason, right? They're all venting through chimneys. So if you have to vent, where do you vent? If you move things, can you still vent through that chimney or do you have to go vent somewhere else? Um, what are some existing ducts again? So where are existing ducts running for forced air systems? Can, can it be upgraded being moved? So a lot of questions about mechanical systems and, and you know, what do you do with those? And most of the people that I've talked to so far um, and the systems that I've seen that basically just replace those systems as part of their process. You know, they, they upgraded to a more efficient system and they, they one woman uh, took out all of the radiators and did baseboard. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about why she went that route, but you know, a lot of people are just saying, I just like to get rid of this stuff and make it better. So, um, something to think about price wise though. Uh, Mike, do you ever yes. run into anyone that wants to have separate zones or a separate hot water tank or anything, or is that just too fancy? Uh, so between the ADU and the, and the rest of the house. Yeah. So the ADU actually requires everything to be separate. So you have to treat it as a separate unit. So it has to have its own heating, cooling, its own domestic water, its own meters. Um, and so, yeah, so they do have to do it that way. And so if you have an existing two family, then oftentimes the question is, well, maybe I should just upgrade all the other units, the stuff for the other units too, or 
to have a single family. So yeah, so they have to be separated anyway, um, at least between the ADU and the other systems. So that's where a lot of the question comes in is like, you know, maybe I should just, how do I do that for the rest of the house in a cost effective way? Yeah, and do you, do you run into using mini splits? Mm -hmm. with, you know, heat, heat pumps? For I was gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we're, we're that, and that's something I wanna talk to you all about too, because I don't, and you guys probably, I, we've, we've installed, you know, heat pumps uh, on our projects more recently and mini splits. And um, uh, the problem is that these spaces are so small that most of these, you know, systems are oversized. You know, they're, you can't have a head in a little, you know, eight by nine foot bedroom. Uh, I mean, it just might be oversized for that size of a bedroom. And so we're looking at ways to basically think about the entire unit as one and then have ways to move air between bedrooms and living rooms or whatever, but do it in a way that I'm not, you know, listening to someone when they talk on their cell phone in their bedroom. Uh, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But yeah, that's that's something I want to ask you all about, actually, because I'm we're, we're, we're exploring that and it's it's been interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's the mechanicals are very big question, I think, across the board um, and just heating and cooling in general. Um, you know, for electrical systems, uh, you know, can existing power handle an additional unit? So is it old or is it new? Uh, has, that, has that panel been upgraded anytime recently? Uh, where are vertical penetrations of wiring happening in your basement? So if you have a, you know, master panel downstairs somewhere and you have wiring that's going up to the rest of the units in a certain location, is that, is that going to affect if you have to move it somewhere else? How you wire those things, or you know, how do you how do you run all those uh, the wiring throughout the basement uh, or any other space for that matter? Um, is the wiring up to code? You know, do you have some old knob and tube somewhere uh, or anything else? Um, and is it difficult to move the main panel and breaker to another location? So there are a lot of questions there. Um, and then plumbing. You know, this, the picture I have on the left here is there's an old plumbing system that's there, and there's a new plumbing system which is the one I circled. Um, however, obviously, a lot of people do patch and repair, you know, just with some plumber that they know where they replace the PVC and leave a big section of cast old, you know, old cast iron above it, which if an inspector comes in there, they're going to say you can't put cast iron on top of PVC because it's too heavy. You can have to replace the cast iron for, throughout the rest of the home. So an ADU will often trigger inspectors to come in and see these kinds of things. And that's what I look for as well and say, by the way, you know that if we do this, you're gonna to have to replace the entire house of cast iron with new PVC to make this thing up to code because that's what they're gonna require you anyway, right? Um, so there's situations like that too when, when it comes to plumbing as to how this all this stuff runs. Um, is the sewer line above or below basement slab? You know, So if it's above the basement slab and it's going overhead out to the street, then we're gonna to have to install a sewer ejector pump into your basement ADU to be able to get all that you know sewage and stuff up into that system, up into that sewer line. If it's below the slab, then that's that's better. Then you just kind of have to calculate how how much below the slab is it, and how can I you know trench and connect into that system to make it to make it work. Um, and so there's there's lots of questions just right there. Just so this is all before design um, things that I'm looking for and talking to the homeowner about. Um, again, zoning, this is really the, the big zoning question happens with attic units and this is what I've heard across the board. This is the only attic unit that I've um, worked on so far. Um, but the question was if I need two means of egress and there was one way to get up and down that was a kind of a main stair to get up there currently, but I need a second means of egress. Can I build a stair on the back of the house for that egress and maybe add a deck or something else? Like what can I do to add that second means of egress? So. Um, so the front of the house is on the left, the back of the house is the center photo, and then on the right is the window that we would open up to turn into a door that would take you out onto a deck and then downstairs to the back parking lot. And so that's, this is, you know, your typical uh, buildable area analysis that you have to do to say, well, where are my setbacks and do I fall within my setback? And luckily this house did, you know, that gray area is the buildable area. The house actually fell perfectly within that space. The, the the lot was deep enough where we had space on the back to be able to add that stair that stair in the back. So we designed a deck and a, a stair system that connected into the existing door in the back, but also allowed that homeowner to get out to the back of that would actually probably end up being their main entrance coming into the space. So um, so those are some things you have to deal with. If it did not fall, if it fell outside of the setback area, then you would have to go through zoning, you know, zoning process with the community. Um, to be able to get your ADU done. And so sometimes that can also be a project killer if they're like, I just don't have to go through all of that ZBA stuff. I'd rather just, you know, think about something else. Um, that's something to consider. So with the, a lot of these attic spaces, it, the biggest, one of the first things I like, you know, you have to look at is really, um, how do I get a stair up, up there, an external stair to get, to get my second means of egress if it doesn't have two internal means of egress already. And then head height is always an issue. Um, 
So here's another project. Uh, it has it's six foot nine from the floor to the joists, and it's a two family, so I have to have seven foot six minimum. And so you know we're working with the contractor to talk about how do we basically excavate and go down, right? And so that's, that's really the only direction you can go. And is it worth again? Is the cost of excavating down worth it? And so we've come up with a couple options. You know that the top left here, without having to know the whole floor plan, is a one bedroom option. Uh, it's a one bed, one bath, and we've left all of that mechanical stuff, all those you know, right, the 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 boilers and all those things. We left them in place next to the chimney. We worked around it and basically just built the unit around it so we could leave all those other things in place if we had to pay all the money to excavate. The second option down here in the bottom moves all those things, replaces all those things, puts in a two bedroom unit in the basement. Um, and uh, it's, we, we're still leaving the left hand side here unexcavated, but we are excavating all of this. Um, and so that we're actually currently looking at the pricing between those two things and seeing what what it's worth. But one of the main things that we have issues with when it comes to excavating basements and get please excuse my sketches uh, is if you if you're going down right so this this quick sketch here shows like, uh, you know, first floor on top of some form of a foundation. Um, you know, typically you have these old houses that have a, a basement slab that sits somewhere just above the footing itself. So it can be there. Maybe it's a little bit higher than that, but somewhere it's, it's, it's above the footing. And if I have to go down two feet, for example, in this situation to be able to uh, excavate far, you know, down far enough to be able to put my gravel in, maybe I want to put in a couple inches of rigid foam to help insulate underneath the slab. And then I put in my slab um, that I'm going to have to basically underpin the interior side of the foundation uh, footing, uh, the footing itself, right? To be able to help support that so it doesn't have any kind of weakness being pushed in. And so when I start to underpin, there's a cost for excavation, there's a cost for underpinning. And then of course I'm left with this like little shelf, you know, here where I'm interior space is here, but then I have some exterior space maybe here. And that's questions about design, right? Do we do built-ins or do we, do we, how do we kind of incorporate this into the overall design of the space if, they, if we're gonna go this route? Um, so there are a lot of questions about how you excavate and then, and then, you know, the excavation itself can be labor intensive. One of my contractors talked to me about this was saying he did a similar basement excavation where, you know, there it was too low at the time and with a single bulkhead to be able to have a machine down there to excavate and pull all that stuff out. So it was, um, you know, it was, it was hand labor. So you head down there with the jackhammer, you rip all that stuff up and you get, you get buckets and you're just shoveling and buckets and then you carry it all out to the dumpster and you dump it and you go back down. And it's just a lot of time and energy just to excavate all that soil out, especially if you're going down two feet, uh, you know, you know as, as much as two feet. Um, it's, it's very labor intensive. And of course it's a very heavy stuff. So where do you put the dumpster? You get a smaller dumpster and that way it doesn't mess up your driveway because it starts to sink into the asphalt and all these things. So lots of questions about um, the worth of excavating downward to try and meet those head high requirements. Um, although this particular homeowner really wants to go this route. So, um, it, that, so we're in the process right now of kind of flushing a lot of these details and, and processes out. Um, Mike, can yes. I interrupt? There are a few questions in the chat. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. Um, so two of the basement, um, one is asking if you have to, to insulate the slab now as you're making it into an occupied space. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, if something gets triggered when you are um, breaking up the slab for a new piping, a plumbing run, you know, mm -hmm. that, how that might relate to it. And then also if underpinning um, would, as you showed, it would work for a rubble foundation or if so that's just like a no-go. Yeah. So yes. Um, so I guess I'll start with the first question, which was um, about insulating underneath the slab. Mm -hmm. yep. And so um, you don't have to. Um, I, so there's a couple of answers, I guess, to this. One of them is that the city has asked me in the past to have a certified HERS rater provide a letter saying that this new unit will be up to mass stretch code. Um, they haven't asked for all the units I've done before, but they have asked for a couple of them. And I don't know if it's because of the specific, you know, space or whatever or not, but they have asked for that before. So when you're thinking about your, you know, potential HERS rating, um, you know, you're basically putting together the kind of conglomeration of what the, the space is, right? So what is the wall insulation, how thick in the basement, what kind of systems are you using in the home? So your heating, cooling systems and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So so it, the calculation happens as an overall rating. And so that doesn't always require you to put a slab or a insulation under the slab, but it is something that I think a lot of homeowners are interested in because they always just kind of used to cold floors. And so is it just a way to help keep the floor from getting too cold as a comfort thing versus a HERS related question. So no, you're not required to, but it's one of those things that could be done if you, for comfort levels. And if you're going to be down there anyway, might as well. Um, 
And so I guess that's one of them. If you're trenching, I think that there's a question about trenching for pipe for piping. Um, Is that if yes, kind of lab? if you're going to already be breaking up the yes. lab for the trenching. Go ahead, Leonardi. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, for trenching related to trenching. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So, so what was the question though? It was about whether trenching. Uh, yeah, if you, if you need to create a large section of trenching to provide new plumbing and drainage, um, are you required to uh, provide insulation to that portion at least? Or got it? No, no, you're not. So you can run that. You can trench it, cut it, drop it in there, and not have to worry about that. Now, if you are worried about you know uh, the grade and if you're below four feet or not, if you think it's within a frost zone, you'll probably want to do some form of insulation around it to be able to put it piping down there for sure. So really, I think it depends. The, the city won't require you to insulate it, but they will be looking, and you as the architect should be, you know, kind of paying attention to where the frost line is, because some basements are obviously, you know, lower than others and that kind of thing. And so it's it's more about that, I think, than anything else. Um, and then the other question was about underpinning rubble foundations. So yes, you can you can do that, and actually we're doing that on another another home. Um, what the structural engineer recommended is that we just did it in, in, in four feet sections. So as we were kind of excavating out, you'd have to do, you know, excavate four feet and then underpin and then do the next four feet and then underpin. So it's not like you can just excavate the entire, you know, the entire footing and then underpin the entire footing all at once. You kind of need to go in place. And there may be some need of repointing or some, you know, fixing of the of that of that foundation and the, and the uh, footing itself. So it really just depends on the condition it's in and if it's been if it's pretty beat up and you see a lot of you know rock coming apart and stuff like that. It could be I'd probably avoid it honestly. Um, but if it looks like it's been intact and it's been well taken care of, then you can do it. You just have to do it in smaller sections along the way, which again is labor intensive and takes a little bit longer. And then um, one last question kind of related to this is this comparison between trying to do this in an older home within, you know, within the footprint. And Elizabeth, do you want to just ask your question or would you like me to read it? I could read it. Okay, well, yes, just before I, I misparaphrase it. You did not, you did not misparaphrase it at all. You know, it's more expensive to make a lot of these changes in a new, in a, in an existing building, you know, you're looking at all the mechanical, the electrical, the, the excavation issues. Um, of, certainly new construction is simpler, but it has costs of its own that are not inherent in an existing dwelling. So I'm wondering if you have any insight as to what those relative, you know, the project, the project that we're looking at right now, if it were in a tiny house, brand new in the backyard, how will it compare in terms of effort and cost? Uh, so I don't know for sure. What I've heard is that this is actually more expensive than doing new construction detached from the from the space. So we've, there's been some preliminary discussions about the costs associated with that. And in general, it's been it's been shown that the new construction, like of a tiny home or some small structure, a conversion of a garage or, or a carriage house would actually be cheaper than having to do a lot of this mainly because you can kind of do whatever you want and it's separate from the structure and dealing with all those existing systems. Um, the one, so what they're exploring right now, the city, when it comes to this new stuff uh, uh, in terms of like new structures or detached structures, um, number one, the fire department needs to have access to it. So they're looking at structures that are at the end of a driveway and not behind the home. So often the garages are kind of behind the home and inaccessible. So can a fire truck either get access to it or park in front of the street and be able to walk straight down the driveway to get to your home. The second part is that, um, you know, they're, especially in other cities are basically having the existing home kind of all the infrastructure needs to connect out to the out to that unit so domestic water lines need to connect out to there uh, again sewer lines need to connect out to there uh, electrical needs to connect out to there etc so it's still part of the infrastructure of the existing home that's there and so is there they're exploring right now well, what would the cost be to try to run domestic water out there and sewer out there especially if i have a sewer line that is a little bit higher than where the grade of the you know, uh, the bathroom and the kitchen and stuff would be for the new structure and things like that. So I guess the, the short the short answer is that, uh, you know, I there are a couple people I've bumped into that have really good high quality and would um, fall right in line with the pilot for the new that for that detached space. And I'm encouraging them, maybe you want to wait another year, maybe two years and participate in this pilot because that might actually be better for you in the longer than trying to go through all this uh, and spend all this money here 
and then you know find that that might actually have been a better idea. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. But in short, I, th I think that that's going to make a huge difference in people's costs. It's going to be it's going to bring costs down. I think and you can be able, you can do more with it. And related to that question about the cost, another um, question in the chat is you know the projects that you mentioned that were for eighty to one hundred five k were those projects that happened to not have a lot of these issues or were you able to you know bring that the places where you had to do these upgrades or move all you know move the beam up are those yeah. in that budget and yeah so the ones that haven't moved forward have it has it been one issues like this that all of a sudden you just realize oh i'm doing a major renovation not just adding a unit and right Great question. So the beam that we're moving up, that one is at that's the high that's the high number there, 105. Mm -hmm. So that's the most expensive one. So that's the one we have to demo all the interiors, walls, kind of you know flatten everything out, do the structural work. That's all that. That's the $105,000 project um, there. The other ones uh, have had some of these things, but not all of them. So this the, was this one. I think it was 85,000. Um, was a smaller basement, had a single, you know, it was a single family home. So it just had the one heating cooling system in the basement. We were, he replaced that with the combi unit, that kind of stuff. So though that's the cheaper one. So the single families in general are, are, are cheaper. Once you start getting into the multifamily with all the multi systems, that really starts to bump mm -hmm. up those prices. So that was kind of, that was the low and that was the high, uh, in terms of the, the work happening there. But, um, any of these projects that you write that have more than I would say three of these issues. It's just kind of it's too much for the homeowner financially to deal with, but it's also just a lot of work to try and fit in an additional 600 square feet or 800 square feet of, mm -hmm. of living space into a into a space there that, that that is rentable. So a lot of them have been paused because of that reason. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are all the things. <laughs> I, don't mean, I mean, I don't need to say that. Okay, uh, you know, don't do all these projects here. Right? But those are all the five. Those are the five main things when I walk into a space that I see. You know, happening in front of me, where I kind of start taking notes and I walk the, the homeowner to bed. So, say they only have one issue, right, or maybe two issues of, uh, of those things that I mentioned. Um, so then, like, okay, yeah, let's, 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 let's get into it. Let's start design process. So then, these are kind of the six things that I look at, but also that the basically the city requires. Are these your typical things that you need: egress, light and ventilation, insulation, and envelope, which we talked a little bit about, um, heating, cooling, fire protection, and your quality, just the space overall. And so, um, these are not as long slides, but uh, you know, going into, we're, we're, uh, was it 130? Okay. Um, so two means of egress, I, these are four different projects. I flipped them all just in, in order so that they're all facing the street at the bottom. Um, so again, this, the fire department's all about being able to see the unit from the street. That's what they care about the most. So when the fire department's on these workshops or anything else, they say, can I see you? You know, do I know that there's a unit there? Great. Um, and so sometimes it's right in front or like the two examples on the side, on the right side there, they come in through the side, but there's a stair that leads you down straight to the street with the pathway. And so um, they need two means of egress. The other thing is that a lot of the second means of egress can exit through a common utility area. So you'll see here on the far, the, the three on the right, there's this kind of common utility zone where all the heat and cooling equipment stuff is, the meters, that kind of stuff. Um, you are allowed to egress out into that space and then out through the back as well. So you don't have to go to two means of egress directly from your unit. One has to be a front main entrance and then the back one can be egress through a common utility area than out, outside of the structure itself. Um, all, uh, Mike, oh, yes. a question on the egress. Um, mm -hmm. You know, particularly on the basement, they're, they're really small units. So yeah. there's no concern with the proximity to one uh, egress to the other. So can you have it very close and that's a great question. Yeah, they they the, they do like the so there's a couple answers to that. The the main answer is that they do like to be as far apart as possible. Um, the the kind of you know that rule of thumb where if you take the two farthest points of any of the, of your square, whatever your shape is, and you cut it in half, they want the, the the two means of egress to be at least that distance or further. So that that halfway point uh, or further from each other. So that's the kind of rule of thumb that the fire department likes to follow. Um, so if you have a you know one point to the other point is you know this is you know, say down here on the bottom left here, the, the one corner to the other say is, uh, I don't know, 45 feet um, or 50 feet to make it even, right? So 25 feet, they want the two means of egress to be at least 25 feet or further from from each other. Um, that's kind of their general rule of thumb 
um, how they go about it. But if you have other things built into it, like if you have a two or three family and you have a sprinkler system in that unit, it might be a little bit more lenient with the, where those two means of egress are because there's a sprinkler there. It's also based on where the bedrooms are located because those also have to have means of egress uh, out the windows. Um, and so there's multiple factors that they'll take a look at and kind of customize for each project to see if, if it's safe, if I can get out relatively quickly, that, you know, that's the main thing that they want to know. So that's, that's on the context of the Boston Fire Department, but not necessarily the building code, right? Right, right. It's, you're right. Right. It's the fire department that really drives the egress. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And same thing with the windows. They, they also drive, you know, the, the window. And so all windows need to be, have be egress windows. Now, this particular case, when we talk about, we're going back to this attic condition here, he wanted to put in two bedrooms. Um, the first bedroom, the bed number two there is easy where they have the arrow, which if I look at the top picture on the right, that window at the top there is going to be that egress window. So that bedroom can be, you know, a double hung window or, or whatever and meet egress compliance. Uh, and that one's okay. But what happens if I'm under the gable itself or under that slope and I can't get out there, right? Um, I can't put a dormer on a roof that's against ADU rules. So how do I, how would I could do a egress window on a sloped roof? And so uh, we had installed one of these kind of fancy Velux skylights on one of our other projects that, you know, it's a balcony skylight. And so we talked to the fire department and said, if we had one of these, you know, cost, you know, $4,000, whatever for the skylight itself. But if we had one of these in that unit, would that count towards egress? And they said, oh, well, you know, you meet the 5.7 foot, you know, clear requirement and that kind of stuff. So yeah, this would, this would count as a means of egress for that, for that bedroom. So then we went, you know, so then with this, we talked to the, the homeowner and said, well, if you want to spend some money on a nice <laughs> balcony skylight, you could get that second bedroom, but that's, this is kind of what you'd have, the direction you'd have to go to be able to meet that requirement. Um, and so there are ways again, to work with the fire department to think about, how do you deal with certain situations that aren't typical to meet those requirements, but still meet the ADU requirements and not being able to put on a dormer, et cetera. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to point out with these egress windows uh, at the basement level is that there's multiple kinds you can get. You can get sliders, you can get double hungs, that kind of thing. I like to spec these uh, you know, in swinging casement windows. Uh, mainly it's because if it's uh, there's a lot of snow outside or there's something blocking the outside and I'm trying to slide you know a window up or to the side, it's a lot harder to push my way out if there's something outside than be able to have an in swinging window where I can just have that clear space and then be able to you know move snow out of the way or whatever and then and then climb out. Um, and so luckily these two, these two windows are basically at grade, which is nice for this homeowner. Um, some of them obviously require window wells and you have to excavate a little bit further out and that kind of thing. So one thing is to consider is if your house is right on the property line and you are required to have a three foot window well extended from the house, does that go into someone else's property or not? And that kind of falls into both zoning and code requirements there. So something to consider when you're doing basement egress windows. But, um, but I like to spec these that swing inward. And a lot of color on this one here, but basically the, the short story is that these by code, they also want you to have um, your common living area, which is more or less your living room, um, it has to have 8% of natural light and ventilation. So basically a window that counts as 8% of whatever your, your square footage is of your living room area. And so if you have a space, like for example, this third one here that has a common kitchen and, and dining or co common kitchen and living area, they're gonna count that entire thing as common living floor space. Um, so I had to make a big enough window here at the bottom to be able to count towards that. And that can be, you know, width and height, you can have long ones, whatever, as long as you have that and it has to be operable to be able to have some fresh air coming in. So that's how you'd have to calculate that versus some of these other spaces might have like, the, again, the far left here, the kitchen and living are considered the same space versus the second one here. It's just the living area because the kitchen's a little bit off to the side in the way and the kitchen does not typically count in that requirement. Kitchens and bathrooms don't count and that hallways don't count. Um, just the just the common living area, and so you know, doing a little program uh, diagram space and exercise of where am I putting my common areas and are there windows available to meet that requirement is a is a big part of how you start to lay out your your, your space. Mike, mm -hmm. a question in the chat regarding the egress window. Um, yes. Last slide you showed um, that egress window. Is that forty four inches to the sill? It is. It is okay. So that's yeah. the requirement, right? Forty four. Yes, forty four inches minimum. Yeah. And so this, there's, let's see here, there, so this guy, he only has one bedroom in his, in his basement, but he wanted to put the second window in there just because he liked it. So uh, this window on the right is outside of the bedroom. So he might not have exactly met the 44 inch requirement. I think it's, let me see here. The one, the, the center one is the bedroom window. 
um, which is I'm, I'm standing looking straight out. So I'm, you know, and I'm 510. So I'm, I can easily climb out of that one. So that one's probably has a lower sill than the one on the right there where he liked the window and he liked the, the, the light of it. So he, I think he just left that existing opening there and it might be a little bit higher than 44 inches because that's in the living room. But yes, yeah, 44 inches minimum to be able to sell height. Uh, I think it's a maximum. 40, right, 40, I'm sorry, 44 inches maximum from the, from the finished floor. Yes, right. You wanna have at least that, or you can go lower if you want. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, 44 inches or lower. Thank you, Doug. Um, and then other things to consider during design is what, how are the basement walls, for example, if you're looking again at basements, uh, are they, like you asked, fuel stone foundations, have they been parged, are they poured in place concrete? Uh, how do you, how would you insulate up against something like this, right? So are you going to fur it out with two by fours and then foam it? Um, you know, one thing we had considered with the middle, with the middle photo there is um, basically building a two by four wall on the floor and putting rigid on top of that, kind of screwing rigid to it and then just lifting the wall up against that, that wall. So you don't have to worry about having to foam it. Um, but, you know, again, foam is better for air and all these other things. So there's also the balance, you know, all the time foam is the question right now about carbon and that kind of thing too. So, you know, how do you meet insulation requirements, but also try to reduce as much carbon as possible in your job and your project. So, um, so, you know, one thing that we have to, we're always thinking about, and I don't have a great answer for all the time is how do you try to insulate all these spaces without trying to use this whole bunch of, whole bunch of foam. Um, I wanted to talk briefly just you know about this this project. This is the one that we ca carved up the first floor space. It's the only one that we've done where we didn't you know we carved up the first floor. So she has a smaller home and she wanted to use the left side of her first floor for her unit, and then her daughter and her grandson can move into the other unit, which would be half of the, the other half of the first floor, and then the second floor. And so the the two images on the right um, are the second floor floor existing floor plan and the first floor existing floor plan. And on the right here is where we start kind of carved it up in the middle. So she ended up with just essentially a common kitchen living dining space kind of some like a studio style set up in there and then she had her bedroom over here with some pocket doors that led to a hallway outside to the front so she could open up her pocket doors let light in as if it was part of her bedroom but she really wanted to she could close that up and uh you know just have this common area here and she that's what she wanted with the small bathroom um, there's a common sh or shared washer dryer and she can have you know an entrance over on this on this side here or in the front to the common entry and then the other unit, you'd come in and you have a dining kitchen on the right. You go upstairs to then a living, a common area and a bedroom. And so I think her son sometimes uses the common area as a sleeping area, but it's 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 really kind of a, a pass through between the bedroom and living area there. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about this house is that it is very old. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to it, but we were able to kind of convert the interior part to help her with her rental, you know, income with her daughter's income can help pay for a lot of these things. And then over time, we also, you know, she can also upgrade the house in various ways. Um, so here's some like, you know, before and after during construction, and this has been completed. She's living there now. I just haven't been able to go over there due to COVID to take some interior photos, but you can see where we started to, you know, build stairs and open up um, new forms of egress. One of the things they have to consider um, when you're working on in, you know, a first floor or an attic space and you're opening things up is, you don't want to open up too much because then you start to trigger the, the requirement for meeting that mass stretch code and having insulate all the walls, right? So in this particular space, it was an addition put on later on, it had no insulation essentially anyway. It was an old kitchen and it was really cold in there. And so the inspector said, yeah, if you insulate just the kitchen area and kind of redo this, that would be fine. But this is, you know, on the right here, looking back into the house and you can see the old, you know, uh, siding and clapboard and stuff like that there. So it's, uh, so it's, an, old, it's an old home. So you can kind of have to pick and choose sometimes how much demo you're going to be doing before you start to trigger a need to redo a whole bunch of stuff on the entire house, whether it's related to the ADU or not. Uh, but some things she was able to spend some money on as part of this project. This is upstairs on the second floor. The two photos on the right was her existing roof where this little dormer was. She had a lot of rain and water damage from a penetration in the roof. And so when the contractor was doing the ADU, he was also able to go up there and do a bunch of repairs to the roof and refix this dormer space to kind of clean all that up. And so a lot of these ADUs do encourage other improvements across the, across the home, which is great. Um, and then there's uh, fire protection, of course, is needed in two and three family homes. So this picture on the left here is a type of, so you can have a, a kind of domestic tank that's hooked up to your domestic water system. They don't, they all come, come all different shapes and sizes, depending on what you're working on here, but they have to meet that NFPA 13B, I think is what it has to meet. 
Um, but anyway, it kind of looks like this. And so if you're doing a basement or anything else and you have a, you know, it's a two or three family, or it's a two family, you have to find space for something like this to be able to put into your home and then have your sprinklers run into the rest of the, into the, just the ADU. Um, if it's a two family, a three family, you also have to have the other units upgraded with hardwired heat detectors. So that's an electrical cost that the homeowner has to know about and how to, you know, be able to open up some of those spaces. Um, and then on the partition and ceiling types here, um, you know, it has to have two hour ratings. So, uh, you know, between units, if you're splitting a, a home in half uh, or you have a common utility area and you have your ADU on the other side, it has to be a two hour rating on both sides. Um, so we just use two layers of five eighths on both sides and uh, Roxel in between. And then for your ceiling, if you're doing a basement or something, you know, a first floor and the, you know, the second floor is another unit, the ceiling also has to have Roxel in between the joists as well as two layers of five eighths. Um, and of course you can, also include uh, resilient channels if you want sound, more sound dampening and things like that. So there's other ways to play with that, but you also have to think about um, fire protection for the units between, between units and other spaces. And then lastly, I just stole this from uh, Airbnb I stayed at one time in New Bedford. <laughs> it's a basement unit because I haven't been able to go into my own homes and see them completed. But I thought this was a great example of basically what an ADU is, uh, you know, what they're looking for essentially in Boston. There, it doesn't meet all the code requirements, for example, like this one doesn't have two means of egress and there's not a, enough light in the common, you know, the living room area and things like that. But I think just in terms of quality of space, you know, with all those things I listed, all those problems that we, you know, have to deal with in terms of getting the ADU put in there, it's also about, you know, what's the quality of space that we're looking like at. So what are the finishes like? How do we make someone feel comfortable in there? What's the lighting like? You know, paint schemes, flooring, uh, you know, finishes in the kitchen and the bathrooms and things like that. So there's also this kind of element of comfort and happiness and, and, uh, and how, how does that get all incorporated into the design and of course into the budget too, right? So how do we make something as cheap as possible? But I thought this was a nice space uh, for a basement conversion. And I think that these are the kinds of things that people are looking for at the end of the day for their ADU. Mike? Yes. Um one other question, is there a minimum uh, square foot requirement for the basement? A minimum square foot requirement for? For an accessory unit? N uh, no, there's not. So I, ha I, mean, I haven't had anything that's been too small to question. Um, at the smallest one I've done is a studio. So we're, we're right now in the process of designing a studio apartment in Roxbury. Um, and I think that square footage is 20 by 20 so it's like you know you know a 400 square foot studio apartment basically um so i'm not sure i you know if you did like one of those you know really small like a tiny home size even something even smaller um i think as long as it meets the, all the requirements i'm sure you could do it uh, i think it's just it's just, as long as it meets those requirements yeah and i think oh i'm sorry I had, the last thing i wanted to briefly talk about was my how I'm setting up this kind of financing or how I'm working with clients on this thing. So, um, so that way we have some time because this is my last second, the last slide here. Um, so in short, the, the, you know, how I've set this up, you know, at first I used to do typical, like, you know, here's the cost for set of drawings and we can get you your permit and that kind of thing. But uh, what we were finding is that, um, uh, you know, at the very beginning, we talked a little bit about, well, here's how much I thought it was going to cost. And at the end, it actually cost this much, right? And, and that, that kind of kills the project for me. I paid you to do, you know, architectural design services. And I have my permit set in front of me and I have my building permit, but I can't actually afford to do the work, right? So how do we work to get there? So what I've done essentially is done a two phase fee structure. Um, I have a phase one and a phase two. And phase one is essentially, you know, we've gone through the feasibility part and said, yeah, you, you have the capacity to do an ADU here. You only have a couple of issues. I think we can probably, you know, get it done within this general price range. So what I'll do is I'll go out there and do existing measurements. I'll do a whole number of, you know, proposed floor plans. And this is typically just like hand on trace kind of stuff, right? It's not like a formal, you know, CAD or Revit type of work. It's just, can we, you know, sit down and I'll chase something out over a few days or whatever, and then come back and come up with some floor plans that they may like or may not like. And we go through that process. Um, I'll bring that those sketches and the existing floor conditions and the photos that I have to the design review that, that inspection services does once a month. So I'll present my quick sketches and even you know, if they're in CAD or a Revit or whatever, um, you know, I'll, I'll present those. But usually what I do is I walk in with very specific questions for them to answer. So I might say, you know, here's a head height issue I'm having, or here's a egress issue I'm having, or, you know, those egresses are a little too close. Am I okay if I do this, if I also do A, B, C, and D, right? So we'll work through some very specific questions I have with, with, with that team. And then after I get that feedback, I might need some updating on my drawings or whatever, or they might be in, in, in good shape. 
Um, so then I do a, a very brief written construction scope of work. And so on the right here is a, an example of that. It's just like a, a two pager that has an overview of what demolition would need to happen, rough carpentry, finished carpentry, MEPs and fire suppression. And I have a contractor who's a friend of mine who is willing to come out to see these homes, you know, not charge me to come out and see them basically. Uh, and I'll walk him through the space and I'll say, okay, here's what we're looking to do. Here's what it is now. Here's this written scope of work and here's my, my sketches. Um, as a ballpark number, you know, what do you think this would cost to do the, to do the job, uh, you know, and again, as a ballpark. And so, um, you know, he'll give me a, a range. It could be anywhere from 80 to $100,000, depending if you go this direction or that direction, or it could be, you know, 90 to 120 or whatever. Um, and so the, at that point, that's the end of phase one. So we've got, you know, some, some floor plans, a scope of work, and some general ballpark numbers. Um, and so then we'll talk to the homeowner and say, okay, now, how are you feeling about this so far? Is that within the range you're looking for? Uh, in terms of cost, if you want to get a second opinion on the cost, this is a ballpark, which we've done before in the past, um, that kind of thing. And so if the, if the homeowner is still feeling comfortable and they're saying, okay, yep, I, I like the pricing, it makes sense. I think we've really kind of thought about this thoroughly. Um, I like option 2A, so let's go with that as my, as my floor plan. I'll say, okay, great, let's move into phase two, which is the actual full permit set. And that's where I'll go into doing all of the floor plans. I'll do the uh, wall and, and, and ceiling details and interior elevations for bathrooms and kitchens and you know any stair details that I might need to add, et cetera. And so I'll put all that together and that will be then the, the set that we'll submit to inspection services for the, the, app, the, for the permit application. Um, if they are at phase one and they get to the point where they're saying, you know what, this is actually a little bit too high. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, this is, I have to wait another six months or maybe a year before I want to move forward with the permit set. I'll say, okay, great. Let's just stop here. Um, you know, you've paid me for the work that I've done so far. Um, you have some drawings in your hand now. You have a scope of work. You have a really good understanding of what the cost would be to actually do this. Um, so you're happy with what the one you spent with me, but you also have something left in your hands that you can keep for, you know, the future. And whether you continue to work with me, you could probably work with another architect if you want to have them pick it up where I left off. That's okay too. Um, but the idea being that, that, you know, everyone's kind of happy at the halfway point because they know that they've spent their money accordingly. And so, and so that's how I've been able to, to kind of work through the, 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 the fee structure. And, you know, the fee can be really high if it's, you know, like not really high, but you know, the, I just use 5,000 as a, as an even number, but the fee might be higher. Uh, if, um, you know, the, the project is more complicated, um, you know, and I explain that to them up front. Here's all the things we're gonna have to consider to make this thing happen if you really want to do it. Or it can be lower if it's, you know, single family, clean basement, nice head height, everything's good to go. And it really just more about sketching and designing more so than actually going through all these other things. Um, then it can be lower, right? Because it's quicker. Um, so that's how I tend to break up my, my fee structure as well. And it's, I've gotten good responses from folks about, about being able to do that and work through the process without having to spend all their money on design and then realizing they're not gonna do the project at the end anyway. So that's my last slide. So I'll, uh, we actually used up the, almost the whole hour and a half. So I'm glad, I'm glad you extended that 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, so let's check. Cause I think there were some questions about, you know, mini split systems. And I, th I thought I had actually put in some slides about that but I don't see it here. Um, in any case, I'll pause there. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to just unmute and um, ask your questions. Hi, uh, Mike. Yes. Your second phase, um, three thousand dollars. I saw the f uh, first half part. I didn't see this, the last. Was that to pull the eventually pull the permit to deliver the permit as well? Right. Oh, no. I'm, I'm reading it now. Okay, collect before have to provide it. Yeah, and so oh, it's, it's just a submission. Uh, you don't it, really uh, guaranteeing it to pull the permit to deliver the permit to the. Right. So, right. So the, what I see requires for the permit is that the homeowner has to pick a contractor and the contractor is the one actually has to apply for the permit itself. So I can't apply for the permit or the homeowner even can't apply for the permit. That's a, a single family. Then they might allow the homeowner to pull the permit in their name rather than the contractor's name. Um, but the contract has to pull it. So basically I get all the drawings put together and, and, and you know, luckily I've worked with the, there's actually only two people in, in IST who are focusing on I, ADU approvals. Um, so they're, that's kind of like their job there. Um, so I've gotten to know them well. And so I, I, you know, I work with them to make sure that I have everything I need in my drawing set for them to approve the permit. And so at that point, that's where I give it to the homeowner and the contractor they've selected and say, okay, go, you guys can you know, upload this to, 
it used to be go down to ISD, but now you have to upload it online to do it virtually, right? Uh, and then they apply for that. And the homeowner has to have things like, you know, proof of residency. So they have to also upload a utility bill or something else and a, a couple other things. But um, but I just basically provide the, the permit set at the end there. Um, could you name them, if you don't mind, those two uh, ISD plans and zoning permit uh, uh, planning examiners? Or there, there, are, there are two are assigned to specifically for ADU projects? Mm -hmm. There are, yeah, so it's uh, Daryl Boyd. Is, is it Boyd? Let me make sure here. Um, I was just emailing with him. This. Yes, Daryl Boyd, so D-A-R-E-L-L, -L, and then B-O-Y-D. Uh, he's been there a very, very long time, and uh, you know he actually knows us pretty well at Youthville, which is great, so I've, I've been working with him a lot. The other guy, I can't remember because he's newer. Um, Daryl was doing it all by himself for a long time, and then they brought this other guy, I think, in March um, around COVID. Um, and so I don't know his name, but I can try and dig that up and, and share that with uh, Christine and Kristen who maybe can send it to the group. Um, but Daryl Boyd is the, I would start with him first because he's been there a long time and knows his stuff with ADUs. Thank you. Do you find, um, oh, go ahead. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed to say the least that you can do all the drawings, all the details, especially fire separation and all that stuff for what to me is a very, very low fee. Well, I'm just using this as an example, but I, I, I agree in general, they haven't been very low, low fees, um, mainly because I think I'm, I don't know enough about it to really say that, you know, it's an exploration thing for me as much as for anyone else. So I think what I've been doing is just kind of using these as ways to get the experience and really kind of nail it down. Um, and now, they might go up, but, uh, but I agree. <laughs> it's been a lot of work for very low fee. And follow, just have you, have you found that you can, uh, oh, I don't know, reuse a lot of the uh, details should be similar and so forth. I mean, I mean I, when I've done stuff like this, it's, yeah. so, it's so complicated with all uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Um, let's see if that went away. Um, I found that projects like this where you're trying to carve out a fire separation, it, the detailing, it's not that the detailing is so complex, but there's so many little, you know, a, a little bit of ceiling and floor assembly, a little bit of wall, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It gets, anyway, um, um, it's interesting that you can pull that off. So kudos yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it, the a lot of this stuff has been a little bit of copy paste and, and now and I think that's why the, the, a lot of the fees, fees have been lower because I'm trying to like build that portfolio really understand how these systems work and at that point I can have a lot of this stuff to say okay here's here's how we have to do it no matter what I think one of the overall goals as well as like me sharing with you all and anyone else who's interested is that if you're trying to take any of these on I feel like this is a little bit of an open source thing for me too and so if anyone is working through these things etc I'm happy to share anything that I have whether it's a construction detail or whatever because um uh, you know, it, it is a learning experience. I think for all of us, the city is still learning about this and how it'll work. And so uh, I think it's more about for me doing it right. And so I think that, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share with anyone who's working through these things. Or if you have ideas that you see here that's saying, hey, this might work better, like steel, for example, which I've explored, but you know, there's other ways that might be applicable and things like that. Uh, this is what it's for me, what it's all about is kind of getting this information out there and really figuring it out because this is first for, for the city of Boston. That's well, true. I, that's my, true. Mike, uh, I don't know, you, you, you tell us if does it have to do because of the structure of your organization that may allow for those lower fee as well? I mean, for a private firm, definitely, you know, overheads and no donations right, coming in to things like that. Is that possible that, that, that plays into that? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So for now, I think right we're charging lower fees more so because we, you know, we're working with folks who were actually coming through the idea that they were going to be applying for some of that funding for their, because of the income level and things like that. So charging lower fees for those particular folks. Um, um, and that was the majority of who we were working with at the beginning. Uh, but I think as time goes on as, and as things start to, especially when they start go going to detached, because I think what you're going to see with folks who have actual carriage houses and things, they own bigger homes, they have bigger lots, and they probably have a little bit more money to spend because they want to convert those spaces. Um, those fees will change. But yes, that's, that's one main reason why we had such low fees at the beginning. And uh, I wouldn't hesitate to 
uh, encourage people to have fees that are more respective of the work involved in this stuff. And that's why for me, if I can help share a lot of that stuff with you, uh, you know, right off the bat, then I think that'll help save you some time and energy as well as you're working through this, you're not doing it all for the first time. I'm going to put my, my uh, I realize I don't have my email on this slideshow anywhere. So I'm also going to put that in the chat um, in case anyone wants to, to reach out. Um, let's see, where is it? And there's also um, another question in the chat um, asking what your experience has been about ballpark figures for the construction cost of the ADUs at the end of phase one. They've gotten much, much more accurate, uh, mainly because I, now that I understand what's going on here, my, mm -hmm. my written scope of work is very much reflective of what we probably have to do. So it's not me doing as much guesstimating on, well, I think we could do this, but I'm not sure, or I think we could do that, that, but I'm not sure. Now that I've actually done some of these projects and seen what it takes to actually move this system over here to convert this system over there and seen some real numbers. Uh, I'm able to both provide the homeowner with some of those experiences myself, but also talk to the contractor uh, in you know, architect, architect and, and contractual language to say, here's all the things we need to do. And it's very much reflective of those things. So there might be some plus or minus in that range there, but it, it's so far, they've all fallen within that, within that range, which has been, which has been great. Okay. It's not the homeowner trying to tell the contractor what the work is, right? And that's um, right. because I know the contract and we've worked together for a while now, it's, it's been helpful to do it that way. Any other questions? Uh, Mike, one more question that I actually uh, typed it in the chatting. Um, just to be sure, existing uh, triple decker, uh, when they create a, a fourth unit in the basement, is that a ADU project for considered to be a? Yes, yeah, you could do an okay. ADU in the basement of a triple decker. Although I will mention that they, uh, the city is, is working on something called the future decker, uh, where they're actually looking at adding a unit on the like fourth floor essentially so up up on the top um so that you're not as restricted with all those systems and stuff that are in the basement um, so it's basically an adu program but focused specifically on the triple decker typology and they're looking at how that can work and so that's something to pay attention to as well because that's going to be i think a big thing and the city is encouraging that so they're in the community process right now gathering information and data because they will be launching that at some point and so you know keeping keeping an eye out for future decker um, from the city <laughs> um, Mike, are you going to share your slide deck with us? Or um, if not, could you just go back to the last slide so I can take a look one more time? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, I can absolutely share it with you all. I'll send it to Christina and, uh, and uh, Kristen and they can, I don't know if there's like a, a listserv for the group or anything like that, but I, I can do that. And I think, I think you said it's also going to be on the BSA. Yes, the, the presentation will be on the BSA website. But yes, I'll um, I'll send this to them, and then you know you can do as you please. <laughs> uh, Mike, could you say a bit more about the uh, work that the youth build kids uh, are get involved in on um, on the, these these sorts of projects? Yeah, so the, the actual, our actual youth don't do a lot of work on the ADUs themselves. They're, they're really uh, focusing a lot on the affordable housing that we're doing. Um, it just so happens because I'm licensed and we actually just had another uh, one of my staff get licensed recently. We in the past have done design services for other nonprofits if they need some, you know, uh, design services that would stamp drawings or some, you know, individuals from the community that need some design services. And so this was one of those examples where, although we were running programs and things like that, we were providing essentially a, you know, design service to private homeowners for ADUs because it fits within our mission and it just kind of grew from there. So the actual youth aren't in here doing demo or construction. They're, they're, they're staying on our, our construction sites. Um, we're just being the architect of record for these projects. Um, one other question, Mike, that came through the chat is if the city maintains a database of contractors who've been working on these types of projects. That's a great question. As far as I know, they do not. Um, and I think that one thing I'm, I'm talking to them about and I'm hoping that we can grow is, is exactly that, you know, is there a way that we can 
have a database of contractors who have done projects who are reliable and, and you know trustworthy in the sense right that they can do the job and do it within a, a decent price i think also for our, for architects too i mean i don't know how many other people are, are working regularly on adus but i think it'd be great to you know have uh, you know a network of folks who are um, and even people who are interested in doing one or two or whatever might come across their across their path there so that we can share these resources with each other, you know, because I think right. that that's that, you know, it, some of these things can be if you're doing it for the very first time, it can be, you know, a lot, a lot of work and sometimes not worth it. Right. But if you have those resources to say, well, here's the situation here, you know, can you help me out? Absolutely. I'll give you all the stuff that I have and available to help get you to a point where we can do something that works. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that's the route that they go with this. Right. Even just like having, you know, some kind of network that you can plug into, you know, I, I assume the city would hesitate to kind of recommend. Right. People, right. You know, and they don't recommend it. people. Right. Exactly. But right. they do tend to say, well, there's some folks here who they have kind of, a list have, of right. have some experience with this yep. stuff. So you can exactly. call them and ask them some questions. Right. Yep. Yeah. Is that how, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your presentation, but is that how people found you was through the city or? Uh, yeah, it was through the city and word of mouth, you know, a couple okay. of it was like, you know, someone across the street from when I did or, or whatever. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's been through the city. It's been me presenting for other clients at the monthly workshops. And then someone sees the presentations like, oh, okay, maybe we'll ask him some questions about my project too. And that kind of thing. So it's just kind of been word of mouth. We haven't advertised or anything about this work so far. Um, but yeah, that's how we, that's how we've gone so far. And we have very limited capacity in house. So the fact that we've kind of reached out to 21 people and have actively been designing 11 projects, I think in the past years has been a, a much more than we ever expected. That's great. Well, you provide a very nice service for people, especially at the price. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I see that we're, we are at 1.30. So thank you so much for really so generously sharing all your insights on, um, on this program. Because I, I think you're right. Like there is kind of, if you haven't done one, it is daunting <laughs> to take that on. So it's really great to, um, that you, you know, um, your generosity in sharing all your knowledge today. We very much appreciate it. Um, and Mike put also, um, in case anyone missed it, he did put his email in, his, in the chat um, box. So if you know, you'd like to get in touch with him, um, his contact is there. And um, I think, is there anything else? Otherwise I'll pound the gavel. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone, it was great to see you. Um, we are getting our um, October meeting set up, um, still working out the details, so, um, but we will be meeting in October. And also, you know, at the beginning of um, the pandemic, we did, a, did met twice a month, met every two weeks, and one of them was a round table kind of discussion. Then we reintroduced our, our other meetings. And so, you know, if you are interested in having some of our meetings be roundtables rather than presentations, like doing a mix, you know, we're we're putting together our calendar now for the for the fall and into the winter. And so, or if you have topics you'd like us to tackle, we welcome ideas <laughs> and also recommendations for people who should come and present to us. So just feel free to shoot us an email. Um, our emails are listed on the. BSA website. So we very much welcome um, some new ideas <laughs> and, and also speaker recommendations and you know your thoughts. So all right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. This was really fantastic. And thank you all. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.